You must learn what life is now, not from me, but from life itself. But if you will hear an old man's opinion, I will give it to you. If you think you can temper yourself into manliness by sitting here over your books, supposing you will grow into it as a matter of course, by a rule of necessity, in the same way your body grows old, it is the silliest fancy that ever tempted a young man to his ruin. You cannot dream yourself into a character. You must hammer and forge yourself one. Go out into life and you will find your chance there and only there. And it was said by James Anthony Froud. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I'll be your host for the next hour. And here we are, folks. It is December 21st, 2012, the date we have all been waiting for for so long. And it's remarkable that I'm even able to say that because I've been waiting for it myself for so long. I find it difficult to believe that the date is actually here and that we have now come so far through history. Very interestingly, here in Australia over the last week, we've seen some very, very strange coloured skies and some very, very spectacular electrical storms, at least over the East Coast. So I don't know whether that has anything to do with date. But here we are, folks. The date is most certainly here. And I don't know about you, but I'm really hoping to see some major changes happen over the next 12 months or possibly even over the next eight months i'm really hoping and i'm expecting to see people really begin to come into their power and people begin to wake up all over the globe i think we're going to see a mass awakening folks a mass rise in consciousness and by a mass rise in consciousness what i mean is a mass rise in awareness of the political situation that we're all facing the environmental situation that we're all facing, the police state situation that we're all facing. And at the same time, people are also going to start to really perceive their own personal power and are going to know what to do about this situation. Because ultimately, all we have to do is to come into our own personal power. I believe people will begin to put down their nationalism. People will begin to see that the guys on the other side of the fence aren't a problem. The Palestinians and the Jews, there is no problem between the people. There are literally thousands upon thousands of Israelis and Jewish people protesting in Israel at any given moment against the atrocities that have been carried out against the Palestinian people. And there are Palestinian people who have no problem with Israeli people or Jewish people. And it's the same in all countries, folks. It isn't the people of each country that have the problem. It's the governments of each country create problems with each other as a mechanism to further lock down the globe and to further control the people within their respective countries. They do this under the guise of national security. But really, national security isn't about securing the nation. It's about securing control of the nation by an oligarchy whose enemy is the people of this planet. And that's what we're seeing, folks, is we're seeing a quiet war that has been waged for a very long time using silent weapons. And there's actually a book that I mentioned last year or a paper that I mentioned called Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. If you haven't read it, I suggest that you do because it's a very, very good outline of what is going on in the world today, regardless of the paper's authenticity or not which is disputed and debated and, of course, very, very hard to confirm. But still, what is contained within the paper is very, very useful information. But people are waking up to the existence of these silent weapons and people are beginning to stand up against the system simply because they're beginning to understand who and what they are. And that's what I think we're going to see, folks. I think this is the time in history that humankind woke up. And we are witnessing that right now. And it's only going to get better from this point, folks. The more our governments attempt to lock things down, the more people are going to stand up against the system. And ultimately, the system will fail simply because it can't win. It's not possible. 
the elevation in human consciousness and the level of understanding and awareness that we're seeing in the world today is unprecedented and it really cannot be stopped. I'm certain that we will see an exponential rise in this awareness in the days, the weeks and the months that we have ahead of us in 2012 and 2013. And let me just talk a little bit about nationalism and patriotism because I've spoken out very often against nationalism and patriotism. And what I'm suggesting here is I'm, I'm not suggesting that you simply turn away from your country and you disregard the place that you come from. Of course, we all love the places that we come from. I love the country of Australia because it's where I was born. I have a real connection to the place and I will always love Australia. It'll always have a special spot in my heart that no other place can ever have because it's where I come from. It's where I was born. We all have a connection to the place we were born. That's one of the things that just happens from being born somewhere. You always have a connection to that particular spot on the earth. And so I'm not suggesting that people simply ignore their nation and ignore the place they were born. What I'm suggesting is that people... Stop seeing it as something better than anywhere else. I mean, it's only really better for you because you came from there, so you have that special connection with the place. But people all around the world have that connection to that place they were born in. And what we see is that this national pride for the name Australia or the name the United States or the name Croatia or the name India, the name of any country, the name Palestine, the name Israel. We seem to place an attachment to the name, to the political entity and the patriotic system that it provides rather than to the place on the earth that we were born. So we've been moved away from any respect to the mother, any respect to the earth, and it becomes loyalty to a name, which is a construct. It's not really who we are. The name Australia is not what Australia is. Australia is a particular spot on the earth, that particular energy from that place on the earth, that energy that I'm connected to through my birth on this place and my birth in this country. And that's what that connection is. But we've had this replaced by patriotism, and this patriotism is used to divide us and separate us from each other. And because of the patriotic view that we have of the world, we perceive problems that happen within our little area on the earth to be unique to ourselves. And we don't see the bigger picture and notice that all the problems in all the countries around the world are connected. It's like the carbon tax here in Australia. I mean, this tax is impoverishing the people of Australia. It really is causing a huge escalation in things such as electricity bills and water bills and all these things that use power, because that's what the government said. See, they sneak it in and say, oh, it doesn't really affect the people. It only affects the major companies. Well, that's great, but the major companies always pass their burden down to the consumer. That's what you are, folks. You're a consumer. You're not a human being according to the system. You're a consumer. You are the one that consumes all of the pollution that they create, and so therefore you're responsible, and therefore you must pay for it. That's the way they look at it. So why this is important to the rest of the world is because they're showing the world a workable model. They're showing how carbon credits work and they're presenting a workable model to the rest of the world that will be adopted throughout the rest of the world. They'll say, look at the wonderful success that Australia had with the carbon tax and they'll use that as an excuse to start doing this in all countries. And that's what it's about. And they, they'll sneak it in some way that you probably won't even notice that they're doing it at first. And that's why the rest of the world needs to pay attention and notice what's going on here. And it's the same as what they're doing in Palestine and Israel. And this is, again, something that we need to notice because what is important about the Israeli-Palestinian situation is the way the Palestinian people are being discarded. And the Israeli government is successfully presenting the way they're doing the discarding of this people to the world as acceptable and simply the norm through the system that Israel has developed of surplusing and warehousing human beings. And so this, again, is a workable model. And I think I mentioned this on last week's show or the show before. But what this is, is a workable model of surplusing and warehousing of human beings. So you can be guaranteed 
that as you see more and more people in Australia become dispossessed from the carbon tax, this surplusing and warehousing technique that is being used by Israel against the Palestinians will no doubt be adopted in Australia. And it will be the same in America. They will start a system of surplusing and warehousing. This is what they're doing. But of course they have to remove the guns from the American people in order to get that to work, which is why we no doubt saw the shooting in Connecticut last week. And folks, that shooting, I mean, there are so many questions about that shooting, not the least of which is the fact that the father of the alleged shooter and the father of the alleged shooter at the Batman killings are both witnesses in the same LIBOR legal case, which I believe involves the Federal Reserve. And it's very, very interesting to see that both of these people are related to this case and both of these people have such obvious connections. It's, it's almost too much, folks. I mean, it, the, the connections between these people and the connections in the way these shootings were carried out seem to be so connected that it's staggering. There's also the reports, if you listen to the police chatter, of three shooters at the Connecticut school shooting. And again, folks, we've got a school that recently upgraded security, and yet we're told that a young man who doesn't go to elementary school was able to gain access to the school in full body armour, carrying a bunch of weapons, and that we just had this massacre. But there are reports, as I just said, if you listen to the police band chatter, that there were three people involved, or at least three people arrested at the time anyway. And it's very doubtful that a young man with no shooting experience could have also carried out such accurate killings. I mean, apparently there was only one person injured, and everyone else was dead. I mean, this is a, an extraordinarily accurate shooter, and yet it is allegedly a young man who had no gun experience. And here we see shades of the Port Arthur massacre here in Australia, which was allegedly carried out by a young, mentally retarded man who had no shooting experience. Again, a very, very accurate shooting, and the event that was used to disarm the Australian people. Another interesting thing was the fact that no one seems to have ever heard of the shooter's mother being a teacher at the school, and she isn't on the record, and yet we are told that she was killed at the scene as well. It's all very, very fishy, folks, and everything about this case is most definitely pointing towards it being a false flag event that is being used to take away America's Second Amendment rights because the government really, really must disarm the American people. It's the only way they're ever going to pull off this world domination because America is the muscle. America is the war machine that's run by the Vatican. And the war machine is what's being used to enslave the world. And that war machine can only be brought down from within. It can only be brought down by the American people. They are the only people on the planet who are capable of reining in what is now a completely out of control United States government. And if the people of America are disarmed, then they lose the ability to do this. Interesting rhetoric from Obama when he said, yes, yes, he believes that people should be allowed to have guns for hunting and after all that's what the American people have guns for he said it's for hunting but we all know that that is not true the American Second Amendment clearly states that the guns are there for the people to protect themselves against rogue elements in government if the government or the military should ever be used against the American people then the American people have the means to defend themselves and to restore the republic and to reinstate honest government. And indeed, according to the American Constitution, it is their duty to do so when faced with such an internal threat. And that is why the American people have guns, and I believe it is extremely important for the American people to realise this during this current time of crisis. Of course, I'm not suggesting that they use their guns. I simply believe they are a good deterrent. It's almost like the mutually assured destruction scenario that we used to see between Russia and America and why there was never a nuclear war. Not that there would have been anyway, but the concept of mutually assured destruction prevented there from ever being anything like a world war, and it still does in many ways. But this is what we see with the situation that exists between the American people and their government. 
it's really impossible for the government to do what it wants to do and for the Vatican and the banking cartels and the forces that control Israel to use the might of America to do what they want to do while the American people are armed. So we still have a kind of a standoff here. We still have a kind of a mutually assured destruction scenario. But should they try to use this shooting in Connecticut to disarm the American people and to bring in stricter gun laws, I would not be surprised if America does lapse into some sort of revolution or civil war. I don't think the American people will be disarmed that easily. I certainly don't think they will be disarmed as easily as it was done here in Australia anyway, simply because the Americans have known what it's like to be under a tyrannical regime. They've had to fight for their freedom before. It's in their history. It's part of their education. It's part of their psychological makeup. The Australian people, well, this, this country was born from a prison colony. The people in this country have never known true freedom, and so they didn't see the problem with giving up their guns because they didn't believe that guns or the ability to defend oneself really equates to freedom. They just had never been trained to think that way because it wasn't part of their history, it wasn't part of their psychological makeup. Because the entire Australian culture was born out of bondage and it's still remained that way, it really has. I mean, Australia is still really a prison colony if you look at the way the society is structured. It's one of the most controlled countries on earth. The people here are completely disarmed. They have no way to even prevent things such as coal seam gas mining from occurring and coal seam gas mining is being used to destroy the water table that's its main purpose is to destroy the water table to drive people into highly populated areas and city areas and so the rest of the country can be strip mined what we see in australia is agenda 21 in its very very advanced stages and of course all completely unnoticed and unrecognized by the vast majority of australian people Unfortunately, most Australian people don't see things until it's too late because they're kept in a very, very, very controlled mindset through television and through sport and through the whole Australian culture. It's kind of a beer and barbecue culture, and uh, people just don't notice what's going on. We have a lot of space here. Yeah, you know, we have the beaches. That's basically what people do to relax is they go to the beach and they, they kick back or they go to a national park and they kick back and... Things aren't really controlled so much in those places. And so, unfortunately, it will probably not change here until people actually see things happening in their own backyard. Once we start seeing mass exoduses from the country to the city regions out of necessity, perhaps people will start to notice then. Perhaps they will start to wonder why it is happening on such a national scale. Our only hope is by then it isn't too late. But again, folks, I think that's what we're going to see this year, is I think we're going to see things get a little bit worse, and this is going to cause people to wake up so that things can then get better. I still stick to my guns, and I do believe we are going to see a rising of the people, a rising of people power in the world this year. I think that people are going to realize that we are all in this together, that the earth is our home. It is the most important thing in our existence and we need to start taking care of it, and we simply cannot allow our public trustees to run amok the way they've been doing for so long. We have to rein things in, we have to take the matter in hand, and we have to change things. And that change has to come from within and has to start with the individual. People just have to let their inner light start shining through, folks, because that's where everything is. That's where all the power is. That's where everything that you need to create a better world lies. It all lies within your heart. That's where the real truth is. That's where the real power is. That's where the real light lies. You're not going to find salvation from any source that is external to yourself. That's something that we've been trained to do through our education and religious systems is to always look for salvation from something external to ourselves when really the true light lies within your heart. I've been telling you this for years, and I think we're going to see a blossoming of this light. We're going to see it shining ever more brightly in the coming months. 
And that's how the world's going to change, folks. It's going to change because people finally step up to the plate. And the way they step up is by the simple realization of who they are and the power that each of us holds within. And I'm probably just flogging a dead horse by even saying this, folks, because I've said it so many times on previous shows. But I think it's important now more than ever for people to truly understand the power that they each hold. Because it is by realizing this power and applying it to the world around you that you will find the salvation that you've always been looking for. And that's how the world will be saved. That's how, if there's ever any ascension, as people would say, it is something that people have to participate in themselves by simply finding the inner power that they have and applying it to the world around them. As I said, I've been saying this ad nauseum for over four years on these radio shows now. But I keep saying it and repeating it so much because I think the importance of this realization simply cannot be overstated because that is where the real solutions lie. When you truly understand this power, when you truly understand what you are and everything, all the whole system that that lies below man, the whole system that controls us is a construct of man. And that's what you are. You are part of mankind. We created this whole thing, folks, and that's when you begin to really see the power that we have. We can create things. We can do all sorts of incredible stuff. Look what we've done to the world. I wouldn't suggest that it's probably the best way we could have gone. I think we probably could have gone in a different direction, but hey, we created all this ourselves is what I'm trying to say. It was all created by man, and what controls man, what controls mankind is simply a set of rules that were also created by mankind. And they were created by public trustees. So we come back to this again. You see, I always come back to the same thing. I mean, I know it's like flogging a dead horse, folks, but once you understand that you are mankind and that the position that the government holds is simply that of trusteeship, that's where the remedy lies. It's just in that realization, that simple realization, because once you realize it, you can see the remedy. You understand what breach of trust is. You understand that a public trustee has to be answerable to the the grantor of power to the trustee because the actions of the trustee obviously affect the beneficiaries of the trust. We are the grantors of power in the trusteeship that exists between ourselves and government and we are the beneficiaries of the trust that they hold. And what they've done to the planet, what they're doing with their continual wars and their strip mining and the, the impoverishment of the people, which is all being done at the whim of governments in order to support economic models. When we see this, it becomes glaringly apparent that these people are in breach of trust and it becomes incredibly simple what the remedy is. Because the remedy is simply to realize who and what you are and to realize what your relationship with government is which is, of course, a trust agreement. I mean, I don't even know why I should even bother doing more shows, folks, but I'll tell you, because this is is what's going on, and this is the answer to the problem. This is the remedy. This is the only place remedy will be found. You're not going to find remedy by sitting there meditating the government out of existence. You're not going to find remedy by voting in new politicians. You're not going to find remedy by protesting and rioting in the streets, by having revolutions or civil war. You're not going to find remedy at all until you understand what you are and what your relationship with these people is. And then if once we declare breach of trust and attempt to hold these people accountable for breach of trust, if it turns into a confrontation where the people are required to exhibit a little bit of force or resort to a little bit of force, well, so be it. But No civil action or revolutionary action or attempt to change the system or anything should be implemented until the people first understand what they're doing and understand how the situation needs to be approached. Because until it is approached by people who know who and what they are and know what their relationship with government trustees is, then no remedy that is ever applied will truly work. It will simply lead to another form of government, another form of dictatorship, another form of tyranny. It will never work until people implement the correct remedy. And the remedy has to start with the individual. It has to start with people knowing who and what they are. That's the key to the whole thing. The light is within you. All the power is within you. Everything you need to change the world lies within you in this simple realization of your own self-worth. 
and what your relationship to government is. And once you understand your self-worth and you realize your self-worth, then what your relationship with government is becomes apparent just by default. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to go and investigate it. You already know that's what these people are. You know that because you know what you are, what your relationship to reality is, and so therefore you understand that it is the same for everybody. We are literally all in this together. All men were indeed created equal. All men and all women all have equal standing on this planet. And anything that says otherwise is simply a construct of men and women. Very often, those who are put in positions of trust and who are required to do exactly the opposite of what they've done. And I think it's break time here, folks. So I'll leave it there for now. And we'll go and have a break. Thank you for joining me on the show today. And I'll speak to you again in a few minutes. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, with this year, folks, and with reaching the December 21st, 2012 date that we've all been waiting for, I think it's very important for people to understand that we're not going to see consciousness flick a switch and everybody simply rise to the next dimension. That's not going to happen, folks. What I believe this point is and what I've been alluding to in many films and radio shows in the last four or five years is that this point represents a tipping point. It's the place where we actually have the ability to act, and I think it's important that we do. I think this is what the rise in consciousness that everyone's waiting for is. I think it's a rise in awareness, but it's what people do with the information that's important. It's one thing to have the information, but you've got to apply it to the world around you. It's the same as, as I've often said, you can be in a state of love and light and have this loving, warm feeling and this warm energy within you and this correct energetic state about you. But if you fail to apply it to the rest of the world, then it's, it's really not going to work. We have to understand that there's only one self and you'll never improve the self by simply focusing on your own individual needs. You have to realize that we're all part of the self. And it's the same with this whole global awareness. And I think it's very important that people don't become apathetic simply because we've reached this date. And it's very important as well that people don't feel shell-shocked when uh, a switch of consciousness isn't suddenly flicked. I mean, unfortunately, we're going to have a lot of new age people who are going to wake up on the morning of the 22nd and be in a state of shell shock and disbelief that they haven't suddenly ascended to the fifth dimension. And it's important that people don't go into depression because they believe that nothing has happened, because something is happening, folks. The energy is quite literally palpable. And I believe what it marks is a point where we can actually do something, but again, we have to act. We have to be prepared to know who and what we are and to stand in that power and apply it to the world around us. And that's what I'm hoping to see this year. And really, the system is coming against us from every angle, folks, with, with what's going on here in Australia. We've got Julia Gillard breaking promises left, right, and centre. I mean, and she was even caught out as telling barefaced lies about three or four weeks ago. It's amazing that she's still in office. And in America, we've got things like the Connecticut shooting that I mentioned in the first half of the show, and this blatant attack against the Second Amendment rights of the American people. In the Middle East, we've got these obvious false flag chemical weapons announcements being staged in Syria. We've got the ongoing Palestinian and Israeli conflict. And I really suggest that people do keep an eye on what goes on in the Gaza Strip over the Christmas period, folks, because Israel traditionally uses the Christmas period to carry out major atrocities against the Palestinian people, both in Gaza and in the West Bank. And so it's very important that people maintain focus on that, even with everything else that's going on, even with what's going on in Syria, what's going on in America, all the posturing and warmongering that is being waged against Iran. And it really is a, a full media war. Even all the movies that we've seen come out recently, folks, you notice how all the terrorists and all the bad guys in all the movies are all Arabs. You notice that. And there was a movie that came out recently called Argo, and something I noticed about that was the dark feeling of the movie, even the grainy type photography of the movie. And Iran was portrayed as a very, very dark and sinister and very disturbing place to be. And really, folks, it's just like everywhere else. It's actually a very beautiful country. 
And in Iran, we have many Christians and Jews and all sorts of people living in perfect harmony. I mean, these religions do get on, folks. And most of these conflicts that we see are not about religion. That's just kind of cooked up by Hollywood and the media. They're not about religion at all. They're about resources. It's about land grabbing. The whole situation between Israel and Palestine, folks, I still have people commenting saying these people need to get over their religious differences. But what they don't understand is that the conflict between Israel and Palestine isn't about religion. It's never been about religion. It's about land theft. It's about ethnic cleansing. And it's about the warehousing, surplusing and eventual discarding of an entire race of people. And it's also very important for people to clearly understand that if we don't do something about this, then what we are seeing is a workable model that Israel can then pass out to the rest of the world and can be adopted by governments all over the globe when they need to surplus, warehouse and discard any sections of their own population, which is what we will see if we don't pay attention to global events and, and start fixing up our own corner of the world, start taking care of things in our own backyard by holding our governments accountable for their actions. And I think it's important for people to understand that we already have a critical mass, folks. We already have enough people to bring about some real positive change. It's just that many people don't know what to do. And what we really have to do is we just have to start applying ourselves to the world that we live in. And we can do this as simply as creating a, a groundswell of public awareness and going to public meetings and start making our voices heard in a very, very public fashion. This is what we have to do. And it all has to be approached from the correct perspective. It all has to be approached from a perspective of trust. There's no good working within the legal parameters. I mean, again, I'm flogging a dead horse, folks. I've said this to you so many times before, but there's no point working within legal parameters provided by the system in order to fix the system because the system won't allow it. It's got this incredibly complex paper-based reality that it runs itself on. But really, we can step above that and we can put the whole lot back in trust and realise that any legislation created by the system that chooses to impinge the rights of humanity to be all that they can be, then the politician who enacted this legislation stands in breach of trust and the legislation needs to be discarded simply by matter of course because the legislation was only enacted due to the power that was granted to the politicians through the trust agreement that exists between them and the people. And any any legislation that impinges our rights, folks, this is clear breach of trust. And again, I go down this passage, folks, and I go down this road and I mention it so many times, like ad nauseum, and I probably should stop mentioning it so much because it really has been such a major focus of, of every show that I've done in you know, probably the last year. But but it, it gets frustrating to see people attempting to fix the system by using the legal parameters that the system provides. And that's what's so frustrating with groups such as the Lock the Gate group here, the group that is combating coal seam gas mining, is that they are always attempting to combat it using the legal parameters constructed by the system. And the system doesn't construct legal parameters so that you can get anything done, folks. They construct legal parameters to prevent you from ever stopping them getting things that they want done, done. They construct uh, a legal system which gives absolute rights to corporations over what the people want or need or desire or anything. You actually have a system where corporations claim to have the same rights as people, and yet they actually have more because they have all the rights of people, but they don't have any of the liability of the people. And yet corporations are a fictional construct. We created corporations as much as we created the law that allows the corporations to rape the planet. And we've really got to step above it all, folks, and that's why it all has to come back to trust. So that's what I'm hoping to see this year. I'm hoping that people are going to get involved. They've really got to start applying themselves to the world, and that's how to do it. Go out and get involved in your community. When there's a public meeting, attend the public meeting. Stand up and say something. See what the people say. See what the reaction from the audience is. Get something prepared, you know, whatever the topic is. Perhaps it's coal seam gas. Perhaps it's fluoride. Perhaps it's gun control. Prepare yourself an eloquent little soundbite of about 30 to 40 seconds, maybe a minute, and get up and make this statement. I mean, you can phrase a question in a way that you are actually making a statement with the question 
And it can be very, very embarrassing for politicians when faced with such questions in public places. And even if they give you some snide answer and quickly turn to another question, well, then it doesn't matter because the seed has already been planted within the ears of everybody who was there who heard your question and your statement. And then again, you go to the next meeting and you do it again. You have a new soundbite, a new question, and you always oppose these things. And by doing this, what you find is that you're planting seeds in the mind of the public. And if everybody does this, I mean, there's, there's so many council meetings and so many things that we could attend and we could go and ask the hard questions and make our voices heard. And we need to do this. Ring up radio stations when there's talk shows on. Ring up television stations when there's talk shows on. And even if they do screen the call and they think you're going to say one thing, well, you could say another once you finally go to air. You could say what you need to say. Whether they cut the call off or whatever, it doesn't matter. You're still planting seeds in the minds of the populace. And all these little things help, folks. So there are a myriad of things that you can do on a personal level. All you have to do is get involved. And see, that's the real problem is that people are just afraid to get involved. But you can get involved in, in little ways, planting seeds in people's minds. Even if you run a cake store, you know, give out a pamphlet, give out a crow house card with the cake or, or something like that. Give out an information flyer with the cake. I mean, you could do something. We can all do little things, folks. But I think that any chance we have to attend a meeting and, and raise issues in the correct way, we should do so. But don't don't turn on an avalanche for people. You've just got to say something eloquent, say something in the right way, something that will be politically correct that people can identify with because it is something that relates to their everyday life. And they can discover all the other stuff on their own, but you've got to plant these seeds and get people to start thinking outside the paradigm and start realising what their true relationship with government is, which is, is one of trusteeship, because that's what your relationship with everybody is, folks. Everything Everybody that you interact with, it's all based on trust. It's all based on respect and it's based on trust. And that's the way we have to approach things when dealing with our governments because that is the only place that remedy will ever be found. And this is the year, folks. This is the year that we can make it happen. So I think we should make it happen. And I believe that we will make it happen this year. I think it's going to be a very, very big year. I think it's going to be a milestone in the history of human consciousness. I really do. I really believe that we've got some big stuff ahead of us, folks, as long as we participate. And I think that we will because I think people are wanting to more and more. I'm seeing people that just aren't afraid anymore. They know the system's wrong and they're not afraid to speak out and we're seeing a huge, huge awakening on a global scale. But the question is, folks, really, what can we hope to achieve with a global revolution? Even with a revolution of consciousness, what can we hope to achieve? What is the direction we need to go in? Because the schism that affects human consciousness and the completely disconnected state of our reality, and when I say disconnected, I mean disconnected from nature, disconnected from the universe, disconnected from our, our higher selves and our higher senses. The disconnected state of human consciousness at the moment lends itself to another so-called civilized society, another corporate model, another structured system when really i don't believe that we should have anything structured i think that we need something that is more organic so that's the question folks what can we hope to achieve even if we hold our governments in breach of trust and hold them to accountability what do we hope to achieve and when i say accountability i don't mean i want to jail these people i don't i don't want to see anybody in jail i just want people to be accountable for their actions i want them to admit their mistakes and i want them to step down from their positions and to live life the way other people live their lives. But what can we hope to achieve? Well, what we can hope to achieve really is a reining in of the current system. And this is something that I mentioned in the talks that I gave when I was out gallivanting around the place. We need to rein this system in and put it back on track so that it's moving in the right direction. And the right direction must be something that reconnects us with nature. This is something that was profound about my journeys, folks, and something profound about my experience in Peru is to see the connection that we could have with nature if our higher senses are online. This will only happen if the human psyche is removed from its current state of fear-based mind control and if the human organism is given freedom to be all that it could be. 
and that can only be achieved by the removal of toxins from our environment. Because I think if we did this, we would return by default to a more organic system over a period of three or four generations, folks, if we removed all the toxins from our environment and all the electromagnetic pollution from our environment and all the stress from the human psyche, we would find that the system would simply dissolve around us because it would become unnecessary. And that's why I don't support things such as the Venus Project, because to me the Venus Project is a machine. It's just too inorganic, and I don't believe that human consciousness could flourish in such an environment. I, I really don't. And I don't think we need a resource-based economy because I don't think we need an economy. I think the economy is fiction. We made the whole thing up. I think that even thinking in economic terms is very left brain. And I think that people do this because they don't understand how far removed we are from what we should be because they're kept locked into this left brain reality. But there are steps we can take, folks. There are steps we can take. And I believe the first step we can take that we have to take is we have to realize what our relationship with government is so we can use the simple concept of trust as a mechanism by which to rein this system in and put it back so it's heading in the right direction, thereby cleaning up our environment and everything about our reality by default. I think one of the most important things that we need to do with this system is we need to cancel all debt, immediately cancel all debt, we need to introduce an honest money supply, one that is not interest-based. Interest needs to be completely banned. There is no reason for interest at all. Money should not function as a means of people profiting from the money itself. You know, People only take out loans because they're in a state of shortage, then you're going to charge them interest on the loan. It's unethical, it's immoral, and it should be banned simply because the money supply is supposed to be there to empower the people and not to enslave them. And that's what interest does by matter of course, and in fact that's exactly what interest is designed to do. Interest simply provides the means for banking cartels to steal the wealth of the planet and transfer it into the hands of those who issue the money. That's its sole purpose. So we need to do that. We need to cancel all debt and, and introduce an honest, interest-free money supply, step number one. And step number two is that we need to remove all of the toxins from our environment. We need to get all the fluoride out of the environment. We need to get rid of all the mobile phones, folks. I know you all love your mobile phone, but we need to get rid of these things. If we are going to have mobile phones, then we need to construct phones that operate on a frequency that is complementary to life and complementary to the environment rather than on the incredibly high frequency and high wavelength devices that we currently have, which are incredibly detrimental to organic life they really are folks the damage that your mobile phone is doing you is astronomical it really is it's it's changing you on a genetic level it's causing cells to mutate it's it's doing all sorts of terrible things folks and i've done studies to know this they did studies years ago these studies were actually conducted by the mobile phone companies they spent millions of dollars on studies because they thought that the studies would prove that mobile phones are not dangerous, but what the studies actually showed was that mobile phones are incredibly dangerous, and so they, they covered up all of the research. But there has been many people talk about it over the years. And so we need to get rid of all of this type of pollution. We need to get rid of the GM food. We need to get rid of all of these toxins out of our environment. And that's the key, folks, because it is the introduction of all the toxins and the introduction of the left-brain educational system which has trapped people into this reality. You know, we're trapped into it through our education, through our beliefs of what is real and what is possible, the belief system that we have that we've been immersed into. And we're also trapped in it biologically and electromagnetically due to the toxins of our environment, the electromagnetic toxins and also the biological toxins. And to this, of course, I'm referring to things such as fluoride, GM food, and the many, many chemical additives, the aspartame, the high fructose corn syrup and all the things that are put in our food. And really folks, when you look at it, what you see is that the result of all of these things in our food is genetic modification. And it's not just what's in the food folks, it's also the electromagnetic soup that we're all swimming around in, the constant electromagnetic bombardment that we are under. This is also doing things to our genes and it's doing things to our genetic codes. 
it comes back to transhumanism. As I spoke about in my recent film, Transformation, it all comes back to transhumanism. Because when you look at everything, none of it really makes sense when taken individually. But when you look at it collectively and you put transhumanism on the table, then it all makes sense. And that's where we're heading if we don't pay attention. And that's another thing that I'm seeing. I'm seeing something really sinister in the promotion of the 2012 date as being a time of massive change. I'm seeing a deeper agenda in this. There are so many people that I believe that are hoping for something major to happen within the next 24 hours. And when it doesn't, there's a possibility that some of them may be so disappointed and so confused and and may simply just give up on life and they may suddenly feel incredibly disempowered and feel like there is no way to ever stand up against this system that no help is coming and it's important people don't go into this type of depression and realize that help is coming but the help is coming from us it's our participation that will bring about change and We are really being given an ultimatum, folks. When you look at the state of the world and you look at transhumanism, you look at what's been done to our genetic environment, then you begin to see that it it really is an ultimatum. We've been given a choice here. And the choice is to go down this transhumanist path and, and let the elites fulfill this transhumanist agenda or to reclaim dominion and reclaim custodianship of ourselves and of our planet. That's the choice and the opportunity that we're being granted, that we're being gifted by this moment in history. I think people really need to look at things that way. I think it's important that people see the awareness of this system as a gift. Because it is. It's a gift, folks. It's really one of the greatest opportunities we've ever been given. It's the first time in history we've ever had an opportunity for freedom And this opportunity is being gifted to us by the ultimatum that is being delivered to us by the transhumanist agenda. Because that's the choice. We either step into our power or we become completely and utterly controlled. And this is the tipping point. This is the moment that we did it. And so I say, let's do it, folks. I think the most important thing that anybody can do at this time in history is to clearly realize that we are indeed the ones that we've been waiting for all this time. It's us. It's our choice as to what we do from this point forward. It's the choices we make. It's the opportunities we either embrace or dismiss. So many people in modern society have spent their lives waiting for a saviour, either Christ or some religious figure or the Galactic Federation is going to land or perhaps it's going to be the December 21st, 2012 date where there's going to be a cataclysm and the world's going to change so I don't need to do anything. Many people see disaster as saviour folks, as strange as that may be for some people to comprehend, but many people do see huge planetary upheavals as a saviour because it rescues them from their current predicament. I'm not going to have to pay the bills because the money system is going to collapse this year. I'm not going to have to worry about paying the mortgage on the house because Planet X is coming and the house won't be here next year. I don't have to take responsibility for myself because in December 2012, human consciousness is going to ascend to a higher dimension. And so I'm going to be saved whether or not I bothered to even participate in this reality. And that's what many people see salvation as. They see it as any number of things. They see salvation as anything that is going to change their current predicament, their current dilemma, without them having to lift a finger in order to do so. But change is coming, folks, and it's coming from us. And it's your choice out there as to whether you choose to participate, whether you choose to implement some of the ideas I've put forth in the show today. And these are just ideas, folks. I mean, you've probably got your own ideas. You've probably got ideas that are better than mine about how you can act. As long as you're doing it in a peaceful and eloquent way and in a way that will empower and enlighten those around you, then I'm all for it, whatever it is. As long as it's not something violent, 
I only believe violence should be used in self-defense. That's the only time I believe violence is necessary, and then only enough violence to repel whatever violence is being used against you in the attack that's been perpetrated against you. I'm just not one for violence, but what I'm trying to say here, folks, is there are many, many ways we can address this system, and this is the year that we have to do it, but we have to understand who and what we are. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Salvation is coming, but it's coming from us, and what is needed is for us to make the right choices and to apply ourselves to the world around us. And the thing is, folks, if we don't, then it's only going to get worse because that's the way reality works. It'll keep pushing you until you decide to stand up and make some noise and start pushing back. And one person can make a difference. I'm just one person. All changes that have been implemented across history have all been made by one person. Look at the changes Aaron Brockovich was able to implement. That was one person. Ultimately, everything that's ever happened in history that's brought about any real change was brought about by the actions of an individual. So don't ever believe that you can't make a difference, folks, because you can. Everybody can make a difference. It's just your choice as to whether to start to do so. All you have to do is fix up your little corner of the world. All you have to do is start speaking your truth to those around you and do it in an empowering way. I've often said the best way to bring the truth of the people is to lead by example in your own life and to let the light of your inner knowledge shine through as a beacon for others to see and for others to, to bask in and to follow and eventually you'll kindle the beacons within their own hearts and they will go out and they will lead themselves. And that's what we want. This is the time we can do it, folks, and all that's needed is your participation. Well, thank you very much for joining me on the show today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you to anybody who's ever helped out with the website. If you can offer any donations, it's really, really needed, folks. They've been very few and far between lately. Thanks to those who have helped. I'm still attempting to put together a Kickstarter for the Full Circle Project, but any donations that anybody makes to the Crow House that they wish to go to the Full Circle Project, please just label that as Full Circle and I will put that into the full circle fund so we can hopefully get this off the ground next year as well. But I'm completely out of time today. Thank you very much for joining me on the show today. I'll look forward to speaking to you again next week. And please enjoy the 21st of December 2012 moment that we've been waiting for for so long. But that is it for me now, folks, and I will speak to you again next week. Please take care until then. In La Keshe.